Ezekiel chapter 7, everyone. And who has figured out the rusty bucket? Why the rusty bucket? Who has figured that out, by the way? Oh, this is a clever group of people. It do, sorry? It, got, it has holes in it. So let's go with that for just a second. The rusty bucket is the name of the shop that sells what again? Idols. Now, idols are these cheap, easy to come by counterfeits of the real thing. And they are all like rusty buckets in what way, Lee? They have holes in them. So just like Jeremiah chapter 2, where God's people dug broken cisterns that could not hold water. So have you ever noticed that when you're worshiping your idol, idols are great because they're accessible, they're tangible, they're, you can count on them to be there when you need them until, of course, life breaks them and you along with them. But otherwise, they're really handy, and they're a lot easier some, in some ways to get to than the Lord himself. But have you ever noticed that while you're worshiping these idols, what, uh, let's see, we have a TV, we have a cookie, we have a wallet, we have a dollar bill, a cell phone, we have a, a smartwatch, I think. And this character down here with the green hair represents anime, right? That when you're worshiping these idols that idols will work you to death. Have you noticed that? Because they give you a few drops, but then you gotta go more. You've gotta work, sacrifice to them more. You've gotta go to them more just to get a few more drops. So like those rusty buckets with holes in them, they're not very good at completely quenching what it is your soul craves. On the other hand, the Lord calls himself the wellspring the fountainhead and he has all the living water and we, we 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 open our mouths to receive it and and just he has so much that we just can't take it all in fast enough so yes good job on the rusty bucket let's turn to ezekiel chapter seven today we're studying ezekiel six and seven how many of you by the way think that ezekiel is going to preach about idols again at some point how many of you think that? How many of you think that's probably, that's probably the main problem the Israelites are having? So yeah, I think, I think later when, when the camp church gets to these other chapters on idolatry, do you think a lot of these things are going to come up again? So it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a bad investment, uh, some of these books, if you are interested. Elise Fitzpatrick writes a book called Idols of the Heart that really, honestly, was one of my favorites. She is a, a newthetic biblical counselor, and she has some really incredible insights about idolatry. So if you need something for your, uh, you can read a chapter of this a day in your um, Bible reading time or your prayer time or while you're having coffee in the morning. Elise Fitzpatrick, Idols of the Heart. All this is in your app, uh, study resources, by the way. And then also um, Brad Bigney's Gospel Treason. He also is a New Thetic biblical counselor, has some really great insights um, about how we actually, how it is that idols are born, how we create them, and, and why, and then how to actually destroy them. So Brad Bigney's gospel treason, and for him, his main thesis is that the idols betray in us places where the gospel hasn't, we haven't brought the gospel into that aspect of us yet, like love. Do I understand the message of love that is intrinsic in the gospel message and the love of God for me? Paul prayed for Christians in Rome to understand how big God's love for them is in the gospel. And you can only understand that if you get the gospel. And Brad Bigney points out that if you don't get the gospel, then you'll go someplace else to get that soul craving filled, and that's going to be an idol. And then as we've learned, the dangerous part is we create these idols and sometimes we think they are God. We attribute things to them as if it was God. And then we've had them for so long that they become best friends, old friends to us. It's very difficult to get rid of them. And so um, we come back to this, though, in Ezekiel chapter 7. Today, just verses 1 through 4, just four verses. Everybody, can we do it? Just four verses. We want to study this. We believe in God's word. God speaks to us through his text. This won't take us too long today, but we want to spend some time in Ezekiel 7, 1 to 4, and then next week, 5 through 9, and then we'll split 10 to 27 up into a couple of weeks. But, but um, today, Ezekiel chapter 7, 1 through 4, and, and uh, here is the message 
that is repeated throughout Ezekiel, really, but particularly here in chapter 6 and 7. And it's where the Lord says this, Then you shall know that I am the Yah. Not, this is not your God. As great as this is, it did not bring you up out of slavery in Egypt. Right? Um, As much time as we stare at this and bow down to it, people on the outside look at us, staring into it and all. We've got to be on it all the time. We have to sacrifice to it, devote our lives to it, pay homage to it. We have to give it praise and sing its praises. But as much as we do that, this did not send his only begotten son to pay your sin debt on the cross and rise again. And that, that's the point of Ezekiel 6 and 7 in particular, is to know who God is and to recognize him as separate from our idols. So we use, we're going to use this phrase today, you know it's me. You know it's me. Would you guys say that? You know it's me. One more time. You know it's me. And we're going to do this today as we begin, just to kind of introduce things. Sometimes we beg and beg God to speak to us, don't we? And uh, he speaks to us through scripture. Sometimes that's not good enough for us. You know, we want something else. We want a lightning bolt or a burning bush. And I don't know. I think that's pretty rare. There weren't a whole lot of burning bushes in the Old Testament, were there, everyone? But sometimes he decides to speak to us through Scripture, um, and sometimes he decides to speak to us through his people. How many of you have found that out? His people, his church can speak to us. So today, I want you to be the voice of God, okay? And your voice is going to sound like this. You know it's me. You know it's me. So we're going to do it this way. Sometimes we... We wonder, you know, things like this. I'm going to point to you, and I'm going to get you to say that in just a second. I want you to speak to me as if you're God's voice. It's like this. I have a feeling that I really should try again to break a sin habit that's in my life. Is that you, Lord? Satan doesn't try to get you to break sin habits, right? Is that you, Lord? I really think that I have uh, fallen backwards in my relationship with Jesus. I stopped reading my Bible. I stopped going to church. And I just have a sense that I need to get serious about following Jesus. But is that you, Lord? Here's a, let's do a little harder one. Ready? I have a notion that my life is in chaos right now. Maybe because God is allowing my idols to be broken. And me along with them. But is that you, Lord? That's Ezekiel's message to the Israelites. God is allowing, causing Israel to be broken along with their idols. And he wants them to know it's him. You know it's me. Let's pray together. Oh, I'll I'll ask you at this point just to pray a quiet prayer personal quiet prayer. Say, Father God, speak to me. We're about to study scripture. Would you just pray, Holy Spirit, bring your light into me. people said, amen, amen, amen. Okay, this is a little different. How many of you notice in your Bibles that chapter 7 looks a little different than chapter 6? Can you see that? What we have here is some high poetry, and what we have here is a very frantic Ezekiel. Somebody said, I 
I already thought he was frantic. He's, 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 he's even more so here. The wording, the language that's used, he uses words here that he uses nowhere else, and very few people do. Um, some of it reads a little jumbled. It reads just a bit jumbled. That's the kind of writing you would do if you were in a huge what? If you were in a huge hurry. If there's something urgent about to happen, you kind of lose your eloquence, don't you? You start to kind of kind of frenzy, just kind of shout in these sort of shorter sentences and, and using these interesting words, but it begins this way. It's the end of Israel. This is a, that's a tame version of Ezekiel. It's the end of Israel. Would you guys say that with me? It's the end of Israel. Chapter 7, verse 1. The word of the Yah came to me, son of man, bin Adam, human. This is what the Adonai Yahweh says to the land of Israel. How many of you remember Ezekiel being told to preach to the mountains? You remember that in chapter 6? And not only the mountains, but uh, the mountains along with their hills, valleys, ravines. Remember that? Why did he preach to the mountains, everyone? That's where all the high places and the pagan altars were and the idols were. And here he's being told to preach to the land of Israel. Told to preach to the mountains, now he's being told to preach to the land. And he yells out, an end! It's the end! Now this is the classic thing that prophets go around saying, right? You put a sandwich board on, you walk around New York City shouting out, this is it, this is it, the end is, the end is coming, right? That's why these guys got such a um, reputation for that, but it's 100% true. Within just a few years... All of this will take place, and uh, this is just ancient history that, that anybody can dig up, but we know from Scripture the Babylonians come under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar and do exactly what Ezekiel says they're going to do. Everyone, he shouts out, it's the end, an end. The end has come on the four corners of the earth. How many of you have the word earth there? Some of you have the, another word, the word land be either one land is probably a better translation because ezekiel doesn't have in mind a worldwide judgment you know usually when you hear the end of the end of the the four corners of the earth you're thinking of something apocalyptic and you're thinking about the entire globe and ezekiel's not talking about the entire globe ezekiel's talking about a nation he's talking about israel and in uh, verse two he's already been told to preach to the what of israel to the land of Israel. This is specifically to the land of Israel. So when he talks about the four corners of the land, he's talking about all of Israel. Very good. So all of Israel. Why is that important? Because to the Lord, he wants to make a clean sweep of the promised land, whether the altar is in the city, whether the idol altar is in the mountain, whether the idol altar is in the ravine or the valley or any other beautiful place under any kind of special tree, wherever you decided to build and set up your pagan altar to this other god and these other gods, all of those places from the south to the north and the north to the south, from east and west, from Dan to Beersheba, the entire land is going to be cleansed of idols once and for all, and the promised land is going to have its rest. While the children of Israel are carried away into Babylon, the land will be at rest and will have its Sabbaths again. And there is an interesting connection between Sabbath rest and prevention of idolatry. And I'll let you guys work that one out. The ability to stop and recognize the Lord and worship Him. And that continues today. Because how many of you know that idolatry continues to be a theme into the New Testament? We have many texts about idolatry in the New Testament. How many of you even might suspect that if Ezekiel was here today, he might say some mean things to us? What if, what if Ezekiel was here today and said, you know, you know, I had visions about the land of Israel and the entire land of Israel from, from south to north and north to south was going to be cleansed of all idolatry. But I have to admit, I've been touring, doing some preaching in churches all over this country. And in the churches, I find that there's idolatry. I find that there's idolatry everywhere. And there was this fisherman named Peter who said that judgment is going to begin at the house of God. 
No, not the church. Jesus wouldn't do anything harsh to his people. Everybody, did God love the Israelites? Yes. Is this harsh? Hey, everybody, let's be honest. Is this harsh? If you, if you could picture what the Babylonians are going to do as they sweep through the land of Israel, God's people, God's love, you can say, this is, this is a harsh thing. Let's deal with that today as we think through it. It's the end of Israel. It talks about the four corners of the earth. Uh, Job 38 uses this similar imagery. It's poetic imagery. It's not like we look back on these people and go, oh, they're so dumb. They believed in a, in a flat earth. It was when you didn't know how to explain, when Job wasn't interested in being scientific, for example, or Ezekiel, or any of the ancients trying to be scientific, we're, we're very interested in that. So then that wasn't the big deal. So they might use poetic terms to describe big things, the universe or the earth. And one of the poetic terms they used was the four corners. And you might think of the four directions, north, east, south, and west. You might, but this image was derived from the shop of a tailor who threw out a cloth. Um, uh, Job, I, th I think it's Job that talks about the cloth being shaken out and the Lord taking up the four corners of the earth and shaking it out like you're shaking the crumbs off of a tablecloth. But imagine a big piece of cloth laid out in a big rectangle before a tailor and it has these four corners. But the imagery, the figure means that uh, all of it, all of Israel. As if the Lord said, you know, I'd love to have a, I'd love to have a revival in my churches, all of them, where everyone gets really serious about idols, and they just, they just get white hot in devotion, and they find them, and they destroy them throughout the land. Hey, didn't I just describe the narratives of the kings and the chronicles? Didn't I just describe that? Like a good king would come, and what does he try to do? He tries to remove all the idols. Do they ever succeed? They can just never get rid of all of the idols. The stinking idols are just infested. Their roots go down deep. And, and it's, a tr it's a tricky business to get rid of idols because our souls are constantly making idols. How many of you received a little gospel track from Smokey and Cal, the ushers today? Can we pull that out real quick? Will you, will you open it up to... Um, just open it and then look on the left side, third paragraph down. Would you just look at that with me for a second? And this is something you, many of you have heard before. John Calvin said something similar to this. But um, a 17th century English minister, everybody see where I am? Okay. If you didn't get one of these, by the way, we have plenty. As you leave, grab one. A 17th century English minister named David Clarkson expressed that the human heart is a factory that mass produces idols. Mass produces them. Like, why do we do that? Everyone, because we've got some soul cravings that just have to be quenched. And if we don't get it quenched fast enough in the Lord, we will very easily and quickly create an idol. We'll, we will churn idols out. And if one idol only gives us a few drops of water to quench our soul, what we can do is we make a few more idols, right? Until And we make them over the years, and we're not very good at destroying them, kind of like the ancient, ancient Israelites weren't. And so we end up accumulating tons of idols, and we have to keep feeding them. It's the end of Israel. Would you just take some time in your prayer time this week just take that little gospel, that little tract, where are your affections focused, and just stick that in your Bible and pull that out, kind of read it slowly, maybe a couple times this week as you think through this, this particular issue of idolatry. Do you know that idolatry is one of the most discussed sins in the entire Bible? You know, and, and we don't, I don't know about you, but I don't think about it a whole lot the way I should. I think there's a lot of reading and there's a lot of thinking that needs to happen, but this is one of the biggest issues of God's people, one of them, in the entire Bible. And here Ezekiel is preaching, it's the end of Israel. Will there be a remnant of Israel, everyone? Yes. Will the Israelites return from the promised land after 70 years in Babylon? Will it ever be the same again? No. Okay. So Ezekiel 
Ezekiel's right. And for Ezekiel, it might as well be the end of the world. The end of Israel might as well be the end of the world. Everybody say, it's the end of Israel. <laughs> now try to be Ezekiel. One, two, three. It's the end of Israel. And the end of Israelites. It's the end of Israel and the end of Israelites. Everybody, verses three and four. And I want to key in on the most important verbs in this sentence. I'll show them to you as they pop up. The end is now upon you. It's here. How many years will it be before the Babylonians come, everyone? Who remembers? Five years. Five years. For the prophets, that's pretty quick, really. Some of them preach and preach and preach and preach, but for, that's pretty quick. But the end is now upon you. Here's the first verb. I will send. I will send. Those of you who know different languages, this is a, it's just one word in Hebrew. In English, we translate it, I will, I will send. And whenever something is, talks about I will do something in English, we say, I will do something. We say that verb is in the what person? First person. So let me ask you, I will send. Who will send? That's right. The Lord will send. All right. And what is he sending? I will send my anger against you. And everybody say, hold on a second. That's not the Christianity I believe in. The Lord would never send anger at me because he can't possibly love me and be angry at me. Moms and dads, is that true? Can you be angry at your children and still love them? How many of you have friends? You still you get angry at them. Do you still love them? Yes, okay. Somebody said, of course. That's the right way to answer it. I will send my anger against you. Here's, here's the next one. And I will judge. I will judge you according to your ways. That's an interesting thing to say. It's, I will judge you. They say, oh, shoot, but not just judge you. I will judge you according to your ways. I'll open up a book that has every thought you've ever thought, every motive you've ever had, everything you've ever said, and every action, every action you've ever done. I'll just judge you according to your ways. How does that sound? And what particular ways he's talking about here, everyone? I'll judge you for your idolatry. I will judge you. And we have a hard time saying that in our culture because, you know, to judge someone is the worst possible thing you could do, right? But uh, the Lord is the judge of the universe. So I'll, let me, since it's difficult, let me get you to repeat these. I will send. I will, send. I will judge. I will send. It's in the first person who's doing the judging. Yes. The merciful God. Is he merciful? Yes. yes. Is he going to judge? Yes. yes. Those things do not contradict the character of God. Do they, everyone? Okay, I will judge. And then finally, verse 3, I will punish or I will repay. It's an interesting word. Uh, some of you have repay, some of you have punish, kind of generally speaking. But uh, how many of you have heard of the Legacy Standard Bible? Do you know that they, they did a revision of the New American Standard Bible? Now there's I know, we need 47 more English translations, but here's the, one of the newest ones, the Legacy Standard Bible, and it has a, it has a, a helpful way uh, to translate this word, I will repay or I will punish. I will put your ways upon you. I will, I will put your ways, a la yik attain. I will put your ways upon you. I will take your idolatry, and everybody, think of what happened during idolatry. Think of what we do when we worship idols, the things we will do for the idols, right? I will take that and I'll throw it on your head is the idea. So yeah, you could just say, I'll punish you. You could just say, I'll pay you back. You could just say, I will hold you accountable for. But the word picture is this. I'm going to take all the sinful action you've done, worshiping your idols, and I'm going to I'm going to toss that on top of your head. I'm going to bounce it back and put it right on top of your head where it belongs. So obviously, it's, it's, all, it's all on you. And I think the rest of this goes under that part, under I will punish. Verse 4, 
Uh, well, first of all, I will punish you for all your detestable practices. Everybody give me another translation of detestable practices. Abominations, right? Uh, any others? Detestable sins. Um, here's one, shocking practices. Now, why does he say shocking practices? This is a favorite uh, description for Ezekiel. Detestable practices, he is describing their what? Their idolatry. Tell me, what was detestable about their practices involving idolatry? It was I mean, yes, they would bow down to the idol. Yes, they would burn incense to the idol. And, and it's pretty awful that they're doing it to this thing that has no life, right? And by the way, they're becoming like the thing they worship. They have no life, right? They create these idols that have eyes, but the eyes cannot. They have ears, but the ears cannot. They have feet, but the feet cannot. This, it was thought that the God then inhabited the idol, right? But the idol was just lifeless, and the Israelites are becoming exactly like that. And so, when God crushes their idols, they're also going to be just like their idols then. They're also going to be crushed, right? But what else happened during idolatry that was so detestable? They might sacrifice children to their idols. That involved prostitutes. These are deplorable, despicable things. Everybody say, we don't do such things in modern 21st century America. We don't do that, do we? Everyone, we sacrifice children to the tune of over a million a year to some idol. Everyone say, detestable. Say, abomination. And the Lord says, I'm coming. And I'm going to judge you for what you're doing. And I'm going to take what you're doing and I'm going to put it back on top of your head. And it's not because I hate you. I'm not lashing out at you. I'm giving you exactly what you deserve for your actions. We had this talk years ago with Moses in Leviticus 26. And I'm doing to you what I promised to do. You get entangled. You get sucked down by idols. And I will break them. And I will break you along with them. This, this, is, this is the Lord. Detestable practices. What does he say, everyone? His eye will not what? That's an interesting expression, right? My eye will not, I will not pity you. You think of those eyes, right? That's usually where you can see that somebody actually feels sorry for something they've done to hurt somebody else. And the Lord is basically saying, I'm not going to feel sorry for it. <sighs> Things you're doing. What you've done, the crimes you've committed. I'm not going to feel sorry for it. Ezekiel says it's coming and it's almost here. I will not look on you with pity or spare you. But I will punish you. I'll pay it back. I'll drop it back on your own head for your ways and for your detestable practices within you. And the nation is infested with it. And so it's the end of Israel and the end of Israelites. I will send. I will judge. I will punish. I will repay. And before we finish things up in verse 4, how are you guys doing with those idol surveys? I mean, did you, get, did you receive one of those when you came in today? What I did today is I put both of the two that we used so far on uh, one piece of paper. It's yellow. Anybody have one of those? Now, I have a couple more for you. Uh, they'll be coming out in the next week or two. But the idea is that we wouldn't become legalistic about this, but we would begin to think, if I did have an idol, what would it look like? Where would it be? How would I know? Um, soon, what are the symptoms of idolatry? Some of us think that symptoms we describe have something to do with the food we eat. Some of us think the symptoms we describe have something to do with pills we need to take. But it very, very well could be, and these guys are good sources for this, Fitzpatrick and Britt Bigney. It very well may be that the chaos in our life and the stress that's in our life is actually caused by our idols. And this is one of the reasons the Lord hates idols. Idols are killing us. They're killing us. 
when I when my anxiety is choking out my faith, keeping me from going to church, keeping me from worshiping the Lord, everybody, that's demonic. That's idolatrous, right? There's there's something in there that makes me I'm cra- I'm craving this thing, I'm sacrificing to it, I'm worshiping to it. That's one of the reasons. And uh, it's good for us to kind of search and figure out what it is that's going on. And so that's why you have those those surveys. Just take some time, if you would, and just pray pray over those. It's the end of Israel and the end of Israelites. The Lord says, I will send, I will judge, I will punish, I will repay, and you know it's me. And you know it's me. The last last sentence, verse 4, then you will know that I am the Yah. And he said this in chapter 6, verse 7, verse 10, verse 13, verse 14. He repeats it in chapter 7, verse 4, right here, verse 9, verse 27. He's going to repeat it throughout his book. What is the Lord trying to get them to do? Then you will know that I am the Yah. This is called a recognition formula. What is the Lord trying to get his people to do? You had all these years to recognize that I am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, who entered into a covenant relationship with you. You've had all these years to figure that out. Since you couldn't figure that out, I'm going to give you a sign. I'm going to keep the darker parts. I'm going to keep the curses, Leviticus 26, so that when you're crushed along with your idols, you know that's me. That's going to be your sign. And then as he says elsewhere, You'll find yourself far from home, and you'll hate yourself for it, and you'll repent, and you'll return to me, and I'll give you a new heart, and I'll give you a new spirit, and you know it's me. Now let's pause for just a second, and somebody say, I don't like this. Somebody admit it, I don't like this. I'd rather go to another church that doesn't tell me about this part of God's character. A church that doesn't look at any of these passages <laughs> or many passages in the New Testament. Because I want to believe in a God that's just real nice. Man, he's nice. He's like the Santa Claus grandpa you wish you had. The one with unlimited resources. <laughs> and if it would tickle you to have it, he'll just get it for you. That's the God I want to believe in. Everybody say idol he looks like the lord of scripture you think he's the lord of scripture but he's not how many of you are ready to admit with me something the lord is willing to allow some really harsh things into our lives if that's what it will take for the greater good somebody say i'm tired i didn't come to church to deal with this today how many of you have read chapter, Hebrews chapter 12 within the last year or so? If not, you jot it down and read it this week. When the Lord chastens us, the writer of Hebrews, I think the Apostle Paul says, nobody thinks chastening is all that great at the time. Remember that time when your dad was just hitting you with the belt and you thought, this is so good for me. <laughs> I think he's right. I think this does hurt him more than me. Okay, thanks for laughing there for a second. Let me take us back down into the pit. (laughs) Nobody thinks that. Nobody thinks, oh, this is so good for me. I'm glad my dad's correcting me. He must really love me. Nobody thinks that. Dad, do you? You do love them. But the Lord doesn't use, I mean, how, how do you deal with an entire people using a belt? You can't. So what does the Lord use to chasten people? In this case, the Babylonians. Earlier, the Assyrians. Before that, just different Canaanite tribes. But in our own lives, does the Lord chasten us? Not the God I worship. The nice God idol doesn't do that sort of thing anymore. That's just something fundamentalist churches preach. and That was in the Old Testament era, but that's not now. Well, Trey, how do you deal with Hebrews 12? I don't read Hebrews 12. (laughs) That God will chasten us. 
and he will allow hard things to happen to us, even to crush us, if that's what it will take for this bigger picture that he's working on. So this is all stuff we know, and this is stuff we're going to need really soon. If it hasn't happened and you needed it so far, you're going to need this soon. Because it's going to happen and you're going to say, God, I, I thought you were nice. So I thought, I, I better just, I'm going to get these thoughts together, so I'm just going to read this. I want us to, one of the things the Lord wants us to do is to acknowledge. Everybody say acknowledge. Acknowledge, acknowledge that uh, he will do the hard love. Let's say tough love, right? We know what that concept means. Hebrews 12, okay? He will do what is best for the ultimate good of us all. And I don't mean he'll do the best so that I'll get that great job and make a million dollars. That's not, not what I mean by the good of us all. He will allow many things that don't seem nice in order to bring us into his holiness. Because to him, that's a lot more important than being nice. He will allow his, follow me if you would, he will allow his son to suffer and die because it is best to win the war. Right? He will allow our discomfort. Everybody says, man, I'm not comfortable. This, I must not be living right. <laughs> What's wrong, Lord? I'm not comfortable. And the Lord doesn't mind allowing some discomfort in our lives. Does he pity us over it? He knows what it feels like. Yeah, sorry about that. But he will allow discomfort when it is best to win the war. He will allow his people to be persecuted when it's best for the war. I mean, he did, these are the guys like Tyndale, who's in the middle of translating the Bible into English. And all of us are thinking... Well, surely the Lord will take care of him until he's done translating the Bible. And he's dead. He's martyred before he can finish translating the Bible. He will allow persecution because he knows that it's best for the war. He'll allow martyrs when it's best for the war. He will allow loved ones to pass away before their time, so to speak. If it is best for the war, because one day soon the war will be over. To him, it's very soon. To us, it can't come soon enough. One day soon the war will be over, and he will win, and all will be right with the world, and we will consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. And all of a sudden, everything will come into proper perspective and we'll say, I'm glad you weren't nice. I'm glad you did what you needed to do to get all of us here. Like that old soldier on the battlefield, that old warrior, his kindness was, was an interesting thing to try to figure, even though he had kindness in his own way. That was Romans 8, 18, by the way. Ezekiel wants us to acknowledge that God would indeed allow our idols to be broken and us along with them if that's what it takes to get us to finally acknowledge him as the one and only true and living God. Let's finish it the way we started. You guys be the voice of God to me. I didn't know if I wanted to go to church today. But now I realize it definitely would have been best if I'd have stayed home. But because that guy reminded me of a sin habit that I have in my life. And it's come up three or four times recently, which gives me the feeling that maybe, Lord, that could be you telling me I need to deal with that sin habit. You know. Is you know it's me. Is that you? you? You know it's me. There's some, a lot of lukewarmness in my life. I can tell. 
And the easy way to tell is because there was a time when I used to be a lot hotter than this for Jesus. And as Adrian Rogers says, if, if you have one of those, if you can remember when you were more on fire for Jesus than you are now, then you're backslidden. It's like, man, I'm backslidden. I'm not excited about reading my Bible or praying. I, I really want to be, and I just have this feeling like I need to devote myself white hot to Jesus, but, but Lord, could that be you? And I just happened to come to church on the Sunday when they're talking about idols. And as soon as that guy started talking, I, th- I pictured three different idols in my life. And I have a feeling maybe I should try to destroy those. But, but is that you? My life is in chaos right now. It's broken. It's crazy. And I'm not even sure how to begin to fix it, but I have a feeling that the Lord has allowed it in order to break my idols and, if need be, me along with them. But could that be you? Let's take just a moment and quietly sit in the presence of the Lord and let him take these words and speak to our hearts. Let's do our best not to think about anything else right now. Let's just be quiet and be still before the Lord. And I'll let the Holy Spirit just speak. And I'm going to step out of the way, and our musicians are going to play for just a moment, and we're going to sing another song. And if you would, during this time, just, just you and the Lord, and just have business with each other.